good carrying voice and will have no problem being picked up. You know. Oh, this is the wrong one. Uh, there may be some people here who were not here last time because of the uh, mix-up in rooms, and if so, uh, let me tell you again, I'm M. H. Ross, and and I'm on the faculty in the School of Medicine in the Department of Social and Administrative Medicine at the University of North Carolina, and I also teach in the Graduate School of Public Health there. So, uh, to repeat, I don't intend to talk down to you in any way, and so without it being over your heads, I don't think, for normally intelligent people, I'll treat you like we would in a graduate seminar, whether in med school or in the School of Public Health. Some of the data on Case History 1, the three tables, are different versions of some of the discussion that we had two weeks ago on health manpower and health, you know, woman power and all. They simply show it in a different variation. The first two tables plainly would indicate the drastic rise from a non-profession, which nursing was, of like in the Civil War, nurses who had to take care of wounded troops and all, the first female nursing. And then the aftermath of that, which even by 1880, with the whole Florence Nightingale impetus, had only reached uh, 15 schools of a very rough and crude character training, with only 323 total students. We don't know the graduates. We don't know anything else in those years on the data there. 1890, it's jumping up to five times as many students. Then the huge rise from 1900 on. And what institution would any of you say is coming into being as a major institution in this country about 1900 that's causing this need for, for labor power? Right. The hospitals up till then are a place, you know, for dying from the Middle Ages on. And society, never forget that, the free enterprise system, society, whatever society you have, responds to the needs for labor power. Now, what do schools of nursing provide in the way of labor power? The old-fashioned school of nursing that's going to become the diploma school of nursing and if you look at, say, the 1920s, uh, uh, look at it. Uh, all they had, there's no AD programs. All you had, except for a few people, uh, are uh, three-year cap programs. And look at that numbers of students, 32,000, 54,000, 78,000, 110. And then we'll say from somewhere in the, say, by 66, there are beginning to be some aid two-year schools around. So the first thing are the numbers of graduates are providing registered nurses who can be licensed. But what is it the hospital needs? Who, who, what are all these students doing there? Huh? You think they're just learning? You just learn in nursing school? No. The, the hospitals need free manpower. Woman power, obviously, okay? This is a labor supply. And it's as close to free as any institution ever devised. No coal mine or steel mill ever devised as good a system, okay? So, you've got more sets to give out. Uh, what you have is, in this case, history one, then, we're following up from last week some of the same things very quickly and getting the contrast. You, the labor supply of an industry and some, one of the great nursing educators in the 1920, in 1920, speaking of wage rates then, says, in no other industry could they get the labor supply they need that would otherwise cost them $15 a week, meaning, you know, nurses' aides, what they might have been paid two and a half a day for six days, for eight and ten dollars a month, okay? You see, it's a huge subsidization, okay, of the whole thing. Now, you've got to remember uh, who's, who is in charge of pushing this movement is the business management of the hospitals and the physician doctors, because come out to the end. 
We don't know what the ratios of doctors were before 1900, nurses to doctors, but how many nurses are there for every doctor in the year 1900? There are, there are a great many doctors. How many nurses do you think there are? That's one-tenth of one nurse, okay? And you see what they've done is push the ratio up so in your lifetimes, by the way, on 1972, please insert approximate where it says 2.0. See the ratio, the last column? That is my simple estimate. I don't have, I didn't have a quick way to do that today. I was pulling this out of four different tables to get it ready for you. And it's my guess that there's some such ratio. What did we talk about last time? One of you up and talk about it a little. This question, what happened to the doctor's work? What did he do with it? Did he do it all anymore like he did in 1880 and 1890? He, he what? He became specialized within his profession, but more than that, he delegated, okay? He no longer gave the shot himself. You see this? He no longer was in a room alone with female patients. I, I hope some of you have seen the how an OBGYN man examined a woman in the, there are drawings, there are artist's drawings by, in plenty of medical histories. A woman came into the doctor's office, there was no nurse, there was nobody there, her dress is down to the ground and she's wearing a hoop skirt and his hand is stuck up under her dress. I mean, that was a GYN examination, you know, and obviously no sink is shown in the room and everything else. You all know that one of the great physician leaders was crucified. Uh, the great Dr. Semmelweis in uh, Europe was sent to a mental institution because he stated that the reason for women deaths in childbirth was the physician. He's the first person who ever said the physician caused women to die in child. They were dying like flies. And he pointed out that in the case of midwives, they seldom died. It was only when they came to the women's lying in hospitals, as they were called in Europe in the early days, this country, that they died. And many of you know that story. It, it should be compulsory reading before anybody goes into anything in health care. They should have to read the wonderful novel about uh, Dr. Ignatius Semmelweis and how he was crucified by his profession when he dared to state this, you see. I mean, how do you, what are you talking about? We're the people saving their lives. He says, it's because you don't wash your hands. You go from one woman to another, right through the hospital, and carry the purple fever right, you know, through 300 people and kill them. Okay, they're delegating their functions, okay? And this is the labor thing. This is just like in a steel mill. It's just like in a computer. The new skyscrapers going up all over the country are white-collar factories, paper machine factories, okay? Xerox machines, uh, peripheral readers, video terminals, uh, computers, etc. They're the new white-collar factory. In this era, there were blue-collar factories. The whole medical care industry is moving from a cottage industry of single doctors to an industry, and you're already seeing how the doctors have this proliferation of nurses. The middle table, I don't even have the figures for 82. I'm 10 years old. Look at that jump in the numbers of RNs, more than double, 238,000 to a half million. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the practical nurses jump, uh, what, almost seven times over. Okay, this is in 22 years, in, in, in an era that is not long before you. And then the nursing assistants more than double. Okay, you're seeing the proliferation. The nurse's assistant, the aides, are doing more in some cases than the doctors did in the earlier years of a generation or two ago. Okay, and you've got to see the proliferation of functions. Last time we talked about this, I'm reviewing it quickly to give it to you in a different form of data. The whole coronary care unit is a place in which there's no question that the way the physicians control the billing, the nurse does the highly scientific work of caring for patients with coronaries, and he does the billing, okay? And sometimes he doesn't know what's going on. Let's hope most of the time he does, okay? But a wise doctor usually asks the nurse what's going on when he comes in there because she's highly specialized. Now let's look at the last thing. What were the doctors doing with their own profession? Were they proliferating doctors? Did they want to meet the needs of the nation? Did they want a lot of doctors around per 100,000? What's your judgment of just those 
those figures for 29 years. That's the years, you see, of physician birth control. It's also the years that you know we created the scientific doctor, as the Flexner Report called for in medical education, so that there's been two historical revolutions. The first was accepting the fact that the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and all the big capital movements wanted an expert to go around and make better medical schools and better physicians. And that, there was no question about that. We ended up with more scientific, you know, doctors better able to save lives and to have a greater knowledge. Then the second historical revolution looks at that and says, that's one way to look at that history. Another way to look at that history is that what Flexner did was assume that Johns Hopkins was the only medical school in the United States and that every one of the others had a measure up to Johns Hopkins. And as a coincidence of all of that, since they put no money into the women's medical schools and the black medical schools that then existed, they almost disappeared down to one in Philadelphia and two black ones in the nation and while they were wiping out the incompetent ones, these were fairly competent ones, the way they financed the thing was to get birth control of doctors and that it was a very deliberate action and they lost compassion in the process. I'm giving you the two schools of thought. The first was one view of what Flexner meant, high scientific new kinds of doctors. The other view is what we've ended up today. Look at those ratios of what they did. They caused a decline from 157 doctors per 100,000 people to 125 by 1929. The opposite of what was happening in nursing. You follow me? Opposite of what's happening normally. Then we know it got so bad there was a shortage of doctors that we had the revolution that brought about the increased medical schools, increased students, increased graduates, and increased physicians. So the 80s will see increased physicians in ratio to population. I'm not updating that, but we discussed that all last time. And uh, the comment, you know, the little paragraph before and the paragraph after is simply to get your minds to realize and that when people are talking about great strides in medicine, you know, uh, also look at the numbers and understand whose ox is being gored, who's getting control, who's doing the billing, what's happening in the world, okay? And the last part of it is just to indicate when they call for teamwork, sometimes teamwork means we're all equals in the operating room. You remember last two weeks ago discussion, right? The aide can make an a, a mistake or the nurse can make a mistake that will kill the patient, so can the surgeon. But there's only one guy in charge and there's only one guy billing and there's nobody talks about his mistakes, okay? And that's the rules of the game, okay? Let's go to case number two because this is your summary stuff. I want to get off of manpower. I wanted to just use manpower to get your minds provoked a little. Why don't you read it through quickly? If you've now had an opportunity to read the materials for case history too, would anyone care to say anything about a statement by the ex-president, a statement by uh, the dean, uh, by some of the two congressmen apparently who are doctors and part of that meeting. Just in case that might sound like just something you put together, I was on a panel uh, testifying before a uh, House Ways and Means Committee back when Hearing. And it had to do with, with national health insurance and uh, pre group practice and so forth, but particularly community health services for uh, low income people. And there was a, a doctor who was chief of staff at a major hospital in, uh, I think, Memphis, Tennessee, one of the uh, western Tennessee cities, uh, who said almost these identical words. Well, let's first, uh, it, is medicine in any way different than any other business? Let's start with that. 
is it supposed to be in any of your views? I mean, is there anything about this last, the bottom quotation? They're comparing it with a uh, second-hand car dealer. Now, second-hand car dealers notoriously are, uh, uh, there's something, you know, people uh, will uh, think of as, you know, capable of uh, exaggerating their products, uh, capabilities and uh, failing to uh, necessarily furnish all the data on its defects, etc. okay? And you might go down the street and take a car out. Isn't that pretty good economic logic that how can a doctor make a living if people are going to go down the street and take the car out of his business? If he's selling cars or if they take what they take his services and don't pay for it. Is that good economic logic or is there some defect in it? Any Anybody care to comment? What do you think? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous why? Hey, well, anytime in, you're dealing with people's lives and, and, you know, it's, I've, I've often heard that people go into medicine nowadays, you know, I mean, people go into these positions and stuff nowadays, not so much as it used to be because they wanted to provide a health service and do something good for people. There was a moral reason for it. Now it's because they can make big money. Okay. You, you don't think that's true of all doctors? Do I do not. Okay. Absolutely not. All right. So it certainly is not true of all doctors. Uh, is it possible that the president, ex-president Carter is wrong, that the AMA came forward with proposals for health research sake? Uh, you know, unselfish things that they came forward and said, uh, we really want the nation to have a bigger, inst say, cancer institute in Bethesda, you know, to look. Is it possible that he's totally mistaken, that most of their proposals were this way? Yeah. I don't know about that, but it always seems to me that the people that are representing, like the AMA, mm -hmm. are, they may well be physicians, but they represent the political end of it, which every, every business has to have a politics. In the right. Medicine is not the only thing. No, no, you're right. And it seems to me that that these the view of these people, they're realizing these views from people that are just involved with the political end of it. And they don't see the day-to-day -day physician and the day-to-day -day healthcare professional that's in and out with the patient. And, and it's kind of, it's a, it's a group within a group. Okay. Uh, is that, first of all, did you get in the description of this group, in the news account at the bottom, that this is not the AMA at the bottom. This is a very uh, right wing, you might say, group of doctors that the dean is addressing, you follow me? They already uh, have condemned uh, one of the speakers, uh, Medicare and Medicaid as stealing. Well, they're, they're national policy signed off on by the Congress and the President of the United States. They're the law of the land, you know. Uh, stealing from whom, you know? Uh, most of us that study the economics of medical care believe there never was such inflation in physician fees and their incomes as took place after they got a chance to bill for the people over 65 on Medicare. You know, they used to do a, a cataract surgery for $225. They've run it up to $1,200. You know, they, as long as the government's paying for it, they've run the, their prices terrifically high. So that these are people that are not even looking at the economics of the thing, okay? Do you agree with what was said about what happens politically? Any of you have any other comments on that? That most political groups, the spokesman is not this far off from the mainstream. And do you know the reasons for that? Like the druggist spokesman, even in a health-related profession, or the, uh, certainly the uh, Manufacturers Association or the Coal Operator Spokesman is not likely to get as far away from this base as the uh, student just described. Do you know any reasons why that might be so? Remember, it's their dollars at stake, right? Because they have to function in a real world. They have, to, they have to function in a real world. They have to make a buck. They don't want a bad reputation. They have to sell things, okay? Now, why in the world would doctors allow, I mean, why in the world say when this dean makes this statement and Atlanta doesn't, the next day isn't the Atlanta Constitution filled with denunciations by other doctors, you follow me? He doesn't speak for anybody, he's a kook, you see what I mean, and so forth. See, why does this go on in medicine? Well, first of all, 
the busy doctors and the caring doctors usually leave the organizations alone, so they let them go to these people, okay? The second uh, reason is that this whole thing we talked about last time, the profession per se doesn't want itself described. I mean, the day he does that, somebody will also say, yeah, and it's because, you know, he operated on some kid's left knee when it should have been the right knee. You know, if that, if he, you know, was everybody's made a mistake, right? And in, uh, and these are all well-known cases, you know. There isn't a nurse that works in a hospital that doesn't know the way this kind of information is sealed off. So doctors generally, the saying is they don't even like to testify against each other in malpractice cases, even where they know the person, say, is a bum or has made an error. They don't like to be called on in any way. That makes it somewhat different. Do any of you have any further comments along that line? Mike, let me add a couple of comments. One, uh, the AMA consistently ranks one or two in the lobbying group nationally in terms of the amount of money spent to uh, Right. Lobby of Congress. Right. Uh, I think this past year they were second, but in previous years, particularly in years during under Carter's administration, when there was still a good deal of prospect of national health insurance legislation and other progressive stuff, the AMA every year spent far more money than any other lobbying group in the country. Um, and some Congress members, like uh, Crane from Illinois, got uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars support as well as uh, being underwritten to go out and give uh, uh, highly politicized medical economics lectures at uh, $2,500 or $2,000 uh, a shot. And that's one thing. The other comment is I mentioned the doctor while I go from Tennessee. After he finished making this statement over and over again and elaborating on it, saying what we need in this country in health care is to let the free enterprise system work. And uh, if government stay out of it and just let the free enterprise system work, then uh, everything will be well and good. And Congressman Corman from uh, California, who was, I think, presiding at the hearing at the time, he said, that sounds good to me. So I like that idea. He said, no. what we'll do is uh, take away from uh, the profession, from doctors, uh, the power of licensure, and the, uh, take away from the organized medicine power to uh, determine who gets into medical schools and let the free enterprise system work. <clears throat> so that if uh, I've got a friend down the street who's read a few books and knows how to take care of uh, what's bothering me, or uh, some young person has uh, uh, observed carefully, or there's a, a good, well-trained nurse who knows how to do an appendectomy as well as some high price surgeon, I'll have the option to go to, to whom I can afford and, and who may be equally qualified. Doctor didn't want to talk anymore about the matter. Well, I think that's that's a good point. In other words, the the criticism of legislation or the people who call for no regulation, if you if you read that last clipping that was in this case too, you notice they even called for an end to uh, Food and Drug Administration, right? Which means testing for the purity of the foods, the canned goods we eat. You all know how dangerous, uh, say, salmon is if it's not if it's found to be carrying a disease uh, germ of some sort, you know, and isn't recalled. Uh, their idea of no regulation, of course, as uh, Reverend Boyer just pointed out, uh, you know, would end up they are such a beautifully licensed monopoly that they actually have monopoly control, as we talked about two weeks ago, of several other professions, and. Uh, they certainly don't mean that, do they, when they call for an end to, to uh, regulation. They don't mean the regulations that enable them to affect a monopoly. Uh, what about the difference? What, what is it that we, if, if, uh, if we expect a businessman to uh, flatly and without um, hesitancy um, be interested in making a dollar and in a school of business teaching that it's the bottom line that counts so that they have to watch their costs, they have to watch their 
expenses of all sorts, their overhead, their supplies, their methods of purchasing and everything, that is absolutely anticipated. And even in a socialist society, the management is going to have to produce in a certain bottom line way. But what is it about medicine that we're saying is separate? And what other things do you think are in that area? In other words, why is it that we are the only Western nation, that is non-socialist, non-communist nation, that does not have total access to health care for all of its people? You're all aware of that, that for instance, Canada, there's a total national health insurance system. In England, there's a national health service, right? Two, two Western countries. Okay. South Africa. Yeah. All right, South Africa and us. All right, we're in good company now. South Africa, as you know, uh, is not exactly in the 20th century on uh, equality of peoples or anything else. It's got its own problems in that regard. Uh, so that 98% uh, of its major workforce, you know, are blacks that are held in subjugation, and uh, you have all forms of exploitation built above that whole thing. But well, what is it that makes good capitalists in Denmark, in Sweden, in France, in Italy, in Canada, you know, in Mexico, anywhere separate out health? So they call it salud in Spanish in, you know, in Mexico. They've they got different words for it. But why is health treated differently, do you think? What else is treated differently? Go back in history. Name something else that sort of comes free, you might say, or close to free, because it, that's the way it's regarded. Any other services you see that, regardless, you don't have to be a, believe in a socialist principle. You socialize that area. Well, you remember Benjamin Franklin was the first postmaster general in this country. We've got an old tradition. And by 1840 or 50, there were uh, 2,000 different delivery companies delivering mail where they could make a big buck, you know, between like uh, New York and Philadelphia, between what was then New York and Buffalo. Those were the main routes, you see, competing with the post office. What would make, in a free enterprise country with mines and mills opening, and profit its motive, and driving forward pioneering spirit, what would make a Congress end those companies and, and their right to compete and declare there'll be only one postal service in this country, it'll belong to the government? And it's true of any civilized country. Don't you see it? It's, it's a necessity. Certain things are, how do you communicate? There's no, the telegraph has barely been invented. There's no telephone, there's no TV, there's no radio, right? It's the means of communication. How can you allow that to depend on whether you can make a buck on it? What's going to happen to the people in rural routes in a country that's 90% rural in that period? You see, they were making their money, these companies, on whom? On the 10% of the population in urban areas where, let's say, 40 or 60% of the money was, the trading money, you know? So they were making their money there. It's not uncommon then for the national welfare or for the good of a people, you see, to say in that area we will not have capitalism. In that area we will not have free enterprise, okay? We'll socialize that service. It's a, a use, a, a, a loose use of the word by me to say the same thing, follow me, that they're nationalizing it, or whatever you want to call it. The British don't like the word so well, so they nationalize the coal mines, they nationalized the steel industry, okay, after World War II. They like removed them. Coal miners worked for the National Coal Board. Steel worked work. You can say right or wrong, you follow me? They just decided in certain areas they were not going to have these kind of unsafe conditions because somebody could make a buck on or something. They just ended it, okay? Where else have we done this? Well, it's a place you're sitting right now. Do you think in the year 1820, just to say, around that time, 150 years ago, do you think that you could go to school unless your parents could pay for the first grade? No, there weren't no. You paid for school. So the bulk of the people were illiterate. 
The bulk of the people could not sign the name. The bulk of the people could not read and write. Now, why would good capitalists find that after a while quite annoying? Leave morality out of it. Morality ought to make them do it, right? Just fairness, a sense of equity. But why would capitalists find this annoying as they begin to develop water power, steam power, uh, machine shops, uh, mines, safety regulations? Why do you think that's... What's causing the capitalists to do this? What makes them change the rules? The way they changed the rules, you see, and brought a labor force into being in the hospitals that we talked about by 1900. Well, how good are illiterates at, at reading a sign that says danger? How good is an illiterate uh, whom you're trying to say he's awful good with his hands? He's a good mechanic, but he can't work in a machine shop if he can't read the draftsman's blueprint, okay? And he can't even read. We barely taught him to sign his name, you know, we've got him to read in a few numbers, okay? You see the point? Education is a necessity for what? For capitalism to continue to grow. How, how can you have retail clerks? You need them by the tens of thousands now. You need young men, later young women, you're going to need typists. How can you go on with the system? You understand? You, you socialize education. You say, there can't be a profit in that. You wipe it out, you follow me? The poorest person will be able to get an education. Now, are you getting the point of why it moves into health care? There's, there's a morality. I don't take away the morality that's behind it, you follow me, that makes good church people or, or good people with a sense of fairness and equity act. But you have to usually have a pocketbook reason, okay? Very often a pocketbook reason that, uh, say, a company uh, shuts down its South African subsidiary is that there's a picket line been around their New York headquarters. You know, they're just annoyed. I mean, every day walking past the picket line, they say, hell, it's cheaper to shut down the subsidiary in South Africa and get the hell out. I mean, that's one way of doing it, okay? There's, uh, you want to say that's a morality, there's a morality of the majority, which is what a picket line always is. It's an element of force, you follow me, of, of saying the majority here want to bargain, okay, or want to act as one with the company, and they set up a picket line. There's the morality of the pressure of religion, the change in the Catholic Church in South America in your very lifetimes. Ten years ago, the Catholic Church in South America was a handmaid of the owners of the plantations and had been for several hundred years. And they cared not one whit about what, what the poor peasants, they did. in fact, they were landless and starving and then a morality, a real morality came through the church with the series of, you know, John the 23rd, all those kinds of things had enormous effect so that the priests with the best contact began to have more and more to say. And today the Catholic Church in some of those countries is almost a revolutionary force against the, you know, for the peasants. And that's President Reagan's problem right now. It's still thinking in terms of 1950 and the, you know, and the attitudes and thinking these are all communists. Unfortunately, they're nuns and priests very often, okay? And they, this is making a huge mistake, one that you'll pay for terribly if you continue down. The CIA agents are not going to make out very well in that kind of thing, overthrowing governments to change. I'm talking to you about immoralities, okay? Education from somewhere by the 1840s is mandated, by the 1850s. In other words, it's part of the greatness of America that in moving west, those farmers were told, form a school district and tax people, you know, for their schools, okay? Now we move to health care. In what ways has morality moved in here? One of your fellow students stated the morality very much earlier. You know, some of them just go into medicine. We already don't like that idea. They go into medicine to make a big buck, okay? Then where did we get this idea of morality? And, and how should we, where should it, is there a place for it to begin and a place for it to end? How much of an intrusion? I mean, is there an argument to be made for a total system like education, totally accessible to everybody? Can that argument be made? That health care is a right. I mean, the opposite of what this man says. 
he says nobody has a right, right to health care. Do you think that uh, some people with morals or good judgment about economics could say no? In the long run, it's cheaper to make it an absolute right. Then what are the consequences? Anyone want to discuss that? Venture a guess? Make a proposal? Be like the coal miners when they're, all, when they're not on strike, they're going to the doctor all the time. When they're, on, when they're on strike, they're never good at all. All right. Okay. Elaborate that a little more and tell me what you mean by, you mean the consequences might be that? Or do you mean that when it happens in one industry, it would have those kind of consequences? Go ahead and tell me whatever thought you had. Was like, like people, you know, you know, I'd be afraid that people start abusing the you know, healthcare systems. You know, it can be like. Abusing it by using it too much? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Nothing I'm against now. You know? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm only trying to get a, you know, some thoughts out here. You could have a system in which it was total access, right? With total access come uh, abuses, right? Do you think every school with total access to grade and high school, some of those high schools have for a variety of reasons in large cities become jungles? Uh, some parents in Fairmont might regard uh, parts of West Fairmont High as a jungle, okay? Uh, you know, there's, there's a, that's your viewpoint, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, what was the old smoke hole uh, uh, down there might have become, a, you know, a marijuana den or, or a drug den or something, okay? Uh, there are abuses and things, but how many levels do you see this? In what country would you use as a quick example that we think of in which people have a total right to access to care, where well, there's a national system? Huh? Well, Canada has health insurance, okay? In other words, everybody is insured in one way or another. Now, there's a higher level than that if you want to go sort of further to the left, you follow me? These doctors are still practicing, but billing, they're all, everybody's covered, you follow me? At any level of income, you're covered. You see what I mean? There's no such thing as saying you're poor so you're not covered. And one, I don't understand the system in that much detail, but. I'm sure it's a, they regard it as a national health insurance, you know, program that has given a coverage to everybody, an eligibility to everybody, one way or another. Where you don't have to work under a coal miner contract to get it, you follow me, or a steel worker contract, or your company gives you a benefit. What goes beyond that, where the doctors actually are into a national system? What country would you throw out? All right, England, yeah. It has a national health system. Now, does it, let's first see how these, a great many countries have this, you know, okay? There's a lesser number of countries with this, right? Something like that. First of all, all, all socialist or communist, guy, whatever you want to call them, where, where the doctors are not allowed to have free practices anyway. You call them be businessmen? That's because neither can a merchant be a free, you know what I mean? It's a limited, the amount of free enterprise they allow and the amount of market they allow is extremely limited. They may allow their produce markets, say, in order to get the farmers to bring more truck type farming, you know, the, the stuff we eat on the table in under a socialist system. But they'll generally not have any doctors loose in, a, in that kind of country. In England, is that true? Well, but they have our traditions so that a person who cares not to belong to that system doesn't belong to it and can just pay for it, okay? You understand? You just pay for it or you can take out insurance for it. But everybody is otherwise covered by, by taxes. And that means under a national health service, uh, your family practitioners are all out there and they have a panel and you're totally free to pick whose panel you want. In other words, let's say Dr. Uh, uh, Watson and Dr. Williams and Dr. Winston are down here in your neighborhood and they, uh, their panels can be between uh, 1,800 and uh, 2,200 people if they can enroll with that. And uh, you go to see him and speak to his receptionist. You've heard nice things about him. He's in your neighborhood. You'd like to go to him. She'll enroll you if she has a room on her panel. You follow me? 
as an opening on a panel due to death or something else. Or one of them may be relatively new and very easy to enroll with, you see, but they have panels. They, in turn, get their full income from the government from doing that panel work, okay? They are part of a national health system. Then when you get in trouble in the British system, you go in to specialists or to hospitals. You know, what we call secondary or tertiary care, you know, into our university system, this type of thing. Now, first of all, the British are different than us in a lot of ways. At that stage, the funny thing is you, when you get sent to a surgeon, do you any longer call it Dr. Winston? Anybody know now in England who is it? The specialist becomes Mr. See, Mr. is much higher than Dr. See, everything sort of... To us, we, we laugh at that because you run around flatter PhDs in this college all the time, call them doctor when, you know, uh, we think of a medical doctor. But to them, the top of the heap is a mister. See, at that point, they send you to see Mr. So-and-so in the ENT guy. Okay, that's small fry. You go to a specialist. He may have a mixed thing. He may bill the government for most of his income, and he may pick up some of it from the people who I told you decided to be in this island out here, you know, buy their care. And then there's a few of these guys that just deal with lords and ladies and royalty, okay? I mean, they're, say, uh, an ENT specialist to some of the royalty and at the same time pick up the bankers and the, the upper crust. There's much more of a class system in England, as you may know anyway. In other words, the, the workers tend to be much more class conscious and connected with their own movement and their own people and the they even judge you by the way you speak. Uh, my fair lady, many of you, you know, have seen all that kind of thing, okay? You, you understand the, it's very important whether you, you say the roining spining falls mainly on the ploying, mm -hmm. or whether you say the rain in Spain falls mainly on the, and the songs are built around it, you see? And so if you can teach her to say it the right way, nobody will know she's a working class girl, see? Otherwise, she's got a Cockney accent, and they've got her pig. So everything's very class conscious anyway. It's a different society. And then is our thing. We're, we're just, uh, I don't know, I guess in economist was to describe it, it's a cottage industry. The reason I say that is it certainly isn't, it, it's a cottage industry in the way it builds the medical profession. It's a cottage industry in its separateness from one another. It's not a, an integrated whole, the way uh, factories have become, the way offices have become, the way uh, any big things have become, with the exceptions of certain group practices and with the exceptions of certain hospitals, you know, and academia in medicine and these kinds of things. Otherwise, it's pretty small potatoes. It, you know, Fairmont being a good example of big cities have it in neighborhoods the same way. And you can go into a big city neighborhood Park Avenue in New York in one block. I used to illustrate in any single block on Park Avenue for several blocks there are more psychiatrists in any apartment house on any block, just one apartment house, than there are in the whole state of West Virginia, all put together. University of Medicine is private practice anyway. It's that you're still dealing with a cottage industry. You see, you're, you're, these are apartment houses in which they're using a room, you know, you're in their uh, house but the front room off the uh, foyer, you know, to the side is a doctor's office, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's urban or rural, there's a great deal of this, a small town. How else would you describe ours? Is it, it gives you free choice? Yeah, it gives you free choice, no question about it. How much free choice depends on who you are, doesn't it? And what else? But that's right, who you are, and I mean, exactly, who you are, I mean in money, but there's more to that. Who you are by your color, or other factors, I'll show you that in a minute, and who you are by where you live, okay? You know all these things. In other words, how much choice do you have if the AMA tells you, yes, but under our system, for all of its weaknesses, you have freedom of choice to select your position. How much free choice if you live near the Marion County, Wetzel County line in the country? You have a lot of choice. You know, you might have somebody in Mannington you can get in to see or going the other way, somebody near Sistersville, right? Unless you start going to Pittsburgh or 
wheeling or, you know, I mean, it starts being, you know, a lot depends how much free choice you got out on a Kansas farm on the prairie, okay? Where the nearest town is population 1,500 with one doctor full-time, one doctor part-time, right? Or in pediatrics, you know, maybe 500 miles either way. So freedom of choice. Uh, you all must know, maybe it isn't true today, that certainly uh, dentists and other people were very choosy about whose mouths they stick their fingers into in this town. When I used to know them all, uh, I could tell you which ones would take no black patients or Negro patients, as they were called in the 1950s, okay? Uh, it was very clear, you follow me? And now the signs are a little different who you are, right? But now the sign may say, well, without a sign, the rule is no what? No Medicaid patients. They don't want to bill Medicaid. And yet Medicaid patients may, if you read the quotation from a scholar, the poor sometimes have the greatest burden of all. So they not only carry their burden, since they're sicker than you or I, they also can't get a resolution of it. They can't get the diagnosis and the treatment they need. Any comments about any of this? This is a fee-for-service system. Fee-for-service. There's no prepayment to it except where people can get to a prepaid group health plan or an HMO or something like that. And the insurance system that we have is not this, not at all anything like this. That covers it. Now, what kind of insurance do our people often have? Will it cover everything? What do you know about it? What, what, what areas of it might it not cover? The typical insurance a neighbor or a friend might have, even in a small company, you know what I mean? First, let's take up the different kinds of things. Hospital care. Does everybody's insurance cover every bit of the, the charges? Do you think? It's rare, isn't it? In other words, uh, to cover all of them. The miners are very happy that they got an insurance that does, and everybody envies them. But very many middle class people, the employer may have up to $32 a day, may have up to $60 a day, may be covering them as a fringe benefit or charging them, but when they get there and find out what the charges are, they might as well sell the house and the car, I mean, if they, they've got a big deal. What about, do they always cover coronary care or ICU or the other things? Then comes surgery, right? Then comes uh, medicine office and all that. Down, when the more you move down here, the worse it gets. It finally reaches zero on many of the policies, right? They cover no drugs, and yet many people, let's take, they're, they're over 65, they got six or eight chronic conditions, they're needing 11 or 12 prescriptions a month, and does Medicare even cover it? No, it covers no drugs, okay? So all this screaming about socialism on that one thing, that's busting some families. That's costing them more than rent, much more than rent. And if you don't know older people, and look into this, this is very serious. Many people's policies don't enable the mother to bring in the small children for preventive pediatric care, the kind of thing they need, so they miss inoculations, they miss out on everything, and then she's sort of happy because it covers hospital care. Great. Is that wise in a preventive sense or wise in an economic sense? This is very costly up here, as you well know, okay? So that as you examine insurance, you see it gets down where now you've got a problem. You need to see a physical therapist uh, once a week for six months. Really, you're out of commission without it. That's what you need. You don't need a doctor. And there may be nothing in your policy about that, right? Mutual of Omaha is the finest name I can illustrate. And the related companies that it has, in which all studies have shown that they are at the bottom of all lists of insurance companies, and yet they advertise everywhere and a lot of people belong to it, in which the small print means that they never pay out more than 48% of the premiums that they take in. They're very, that's a very good business if you get, get into it. I, I don't know many 52% businesses, but if any of you have any, I'd like to get with you on it before you leave. So pass the word to me. Okay. Any comments about this whole business? 
What is it that makes people move from this, where they all were, to here, countries, and some to here? What is that driving force? It is in part the dissatisfaction, you see, about this, and that never, do you think people get dissatisfied when the Medicaid people are hurt? No, it's when, take unemployment. There's no bigger lesson several million blue-collar workers got between 1880 when they voted and 18, December 1882 when they're laid off, right, in the interim on the realities of economics. And sometimes it's that two by four on the side of the head that does people in. You see, it's what sort of makes them, my God, Mildred, you, you sound radical, you know. It's when she's had to, they face this. They seldom see it the way you we're seeing it in the classroom, abstractly, it's already hurting millions of people. You follow me? It's like the unemployment thing. Until the guy is hurt with it, they seldom get scared. They sometimes get scared if a brother gets laid off, and not the same thing. A neighbor, they see it closing in. It changes their politics and all. But they seldom move in this area. First of all, they're attached to doctors. Most of us like our individual doctors, but we change, you know? And that makes an attachment. You're worried. How will a system work, you know? So any system worries them. And then, of course, the words are always dirty words, right? You know, socialism. I don't know anything dirtier than that, you know? Yeah, there is a dirtier one. Communism, right? I mean, you know, so you can... They all sound pretty awful. And if you say, yeah, but the conservatives in England, starting with Mrs. Thatcher, who is to the right of Ronald Reagan, will not give up the national health system, services. She will not give it up. The most she will do is say, I think they should pay two shillings for each prescription instead of one shilling, now that the shilling has gone down to next to nothing, okay? So they better put in at least 12 or 16 cents for a prescription, you know. We, we're going to really punish them to stop what you were talking about. You probably said, like some people who run in a thing is totally free, you know, for every last thing, so they come out with a, an amendment on the side, you follow me? And the problem with the amendments in insurance are very serious. Let me illustrate some of them to you. This is all health insurance, right? And a lot of people say, well, it's health insurance, but it's the same principle as life insurance, it's the same principle as car insurance. Well, let's just take that simple example an example. Is there any resemblance between what ought to be the considerations of how insurance works here and on car, auto insurance? Why do I compare them for you? What are the commonest ways of keeping a premium? Now that premiums are running away and costs are running away, what are the commonest ways that auto insurers and the options they give you, we handle auto insurance to keep it from costing us prohibitive amounts. What are the ways? Deductions. De very, very important. Deductions. Okay? Another co payments. Okay? Now let's take both those a minute. Those are two ways. Deductible meaning. There's a flat amount they don't even want to hear from you about, right? If you opt for under 250 or opt for under 500, your premium goes down. Don't tell us your troubles unless you got, right? We don't want to even hear from you. You don't exist. No cost to them. If you had a $499 damage, you had $500 deductible. That's a big way to cut your premium, right? And it's something you can conceive of. You know, I got a $10,000 car. I'll handle it up to then because I don't want to be paying out every six months this extra $42 or something, whatever it is. You, you reason it out or you decide not to reason it out. The lower you keep it. Remember, it used to be a few years ago you could actually get $50 deductibles. Now some of them have abolished all that, right? And they're up, you know, at higher ones. Okay, copayment is not as common, but it's like you pay 50% and they pay 50% and you pay 20% of the, all the amount over a certain amount. They are punishing devices to stop either they cut costs by punishing, you follow me? They like penalize you so that they cut the cost, make it reasonable, okay? 
Now let's take those over into health care, because we have some examples, and see how they work. And many insurers have done so. They've brought this over. Anybody know of any policies like this? Major medicals, the best example. Okay? Major medicals are very often the new UMW, the old UMW funds. The funds were wiped out and replaced by insurance companies who instituted co-payments up to a deductible. That's a variable on that same pattern. And many insurance companies, major medicals do that. They'll tell you, we'll pay for up to a semi-private room in the hospital for so many days or a certain rate, okay? We'll pay up to a certain surgical schedule. But we don't want to hear about any of this down here. We don't want to know about you know, preventive medicine. We don't want to know about pediatrics. We don't know about going to see the doctor when you feel bad regular exam, but we'll put it all into a package called major medical, and you pay the first hundred dollars. These vary for me. You know, Owens, Illinois had a 75 one. They vary all over the lot, okay? You pay some sum, like a hundred dollars, and over that you pay 20 percent, deductible equal 100. This is an example plus over the 100, 28. You pay 20% and we'll pay 80%, okay? That's a form of deductible. How did the insurance companies that the coal companies worked out introduce it? They said to the working miner, every time you are a member of your family, we'll pay for you in the hospital, we'll pay for you in surgery, okay? But every time you or a member of your family see a physician outpatient, you will pay $7.50 up to 20 times that or $150 deductible. From then on, we'll pay for it, okay? We stand together. They're different versions of the same thing, aren't they? There's other ways. What are they hoping to achieve? You. you you want to continue? Because you were saying there was there were abuses in the other. What what might this achieve? What do you think's in their mind in, in introducing this kind of thing? Anyone want to venture a guess? They'll cut down some of their costs, won't they? People won't run to the doctor this easily, right? If the coal's going to take care of itself by drinking hot tea and a lot of orange juice, you know, you'll, you'll have it, right? You won't have a cost. Now, how does it work out? The problem with punishing devices to save costs is that your body is not a dented fender. Okay? There's all the difference in the world between a dented fender or a broken headlight, you know, or, or carelessness with a car and a human body. And it's important that when you see some of those first signs of cancer that are described by the American Cancer Society, that you go to the hospital? No. That you go to surgery? No. That you do what? That you go to the doctor in the office for preventive care, right? And to the extent that you cut people off with penalties, see down here? To that extent, you end up with somebody in bed at the university for $22,000 or something up here a year later, see? Lung cancer. Some forms of lung cancer can move how fast? Right from uh, the first onset of a the slightest symptom to death inside of six months. And, and, and uh, over 50% of the cases within a year, okay? Uh, aren't there other things of this order, right? That could be small, taken care of, and, and mount up, okay? So the dented fender theory, you see, doesn't apply over here. You see now the logic of what's happening. People with this system don't ideologically or philosophically want to move to another system. What else are you to do with it? You follow me? It's like we, we've tried everything. We're trying costs. We're trying deductibles. And why do big businessmen go along with it then? Why do they tolerate this and keep it in effect? Because it's like the post office. It's like education. My God, you know, we can't worry. We've got to protect the main part 
of the system to make a profit and to make a buck, you know, in, in, in manufacturing and in industry and in retail and wholesale and banking, where most people work and not worry about the fact that in those areas, capitalism produces a good, clean service for a fair profit on a good market. In this area, there is no real market. Why do they think that? Why would businessmen imagine that you really can't judge the market here? That you can judge a car. You can have consumers' union judge a car if you don't want to judge it, right? Or some other ways of getting evaluations. And some of you nod your heads, so I'm scared of you. You're nurses or something, and you sort of know which doctors to leave alone in Marion County and who to go to, so I'm leaving you all out of it. But for most of us, it's a much tougher problem, isn't it? You judge the person by their bedside manner, as we say, right? And does that always work? One of the most popular guys in Marion County, really popular, really nice guy to talk to, treated a patient every week for a very reasonable fee, $4, all during the 1960s, with a win on his neck. Only problem was, he didn't understand it was a evidence of a leukemia, see? The guy loved him. Loved him right up to the time, you know, after four years of it, and it progressed so that at 35 years old, this truck driver walking in for the first time to a diagnostician, okay? A stranger, you see, and, uh, and because I know of it because, you know, the case coming in to a place I was at, uh, you know, he look, takes one look at it and sends him right down to the lab, you see what I mean? And then sections it a week later, and he, the poor guy then has only so many years to live because, you know, that kind of leukemia was treatable at that age, you follow me? And we can do this all the time. This is one of the nicest, probably a nicer person than a diagnostician, okay? Nicer for me to talk to, certainly, you know. Uh, you can pass the time of day with you, easy to get along with. You see, you can't judge the product. You, uh, the average person, how many of you think you know who's board certified in Marion County in their specialty and who's not? How many of you think you know that? Raise your hand. And if you think you know, if you don't know, how many of you know exactly where to go to find out? You want only a board-certified pediatrician say, take care of your child. Or you want to go yourself to an adult medicine board-certified in internal medicine. How many of you think you know how to look that up? You want to, do you understand what I'm talking about? Why some capitalists say, hey, that's not like our business. In our business, people can feel the product, they can kick the tires, right? How the hell do you kick the tires in this business, you see? So people go to people that kill them, okay? There's a whole field of medicine. Anybody know the name of medical school, but not necessarily known, okay? Iatrogenics means it's physician-induced illness. You go to them with a cold that he thinks is flu. He doesn't test you to see if you'll react to Penicillin, he gives you a shot of penicillin and you drop dead. You would have been alive and you would have lived a fruitful life till you were in old age if he had sent you home to, you know, with orange juice and aspirin and, and he's killed you, okay? That's the simplest kind of case, okay? Uh, how much more complex is it when physicians without good training can't even keep up with the drugs? Anybody know what a drug detail man is? What's a drug detail man? Does that word mean anything to you? The word detail man means the person who goes around only to physicians' offices for a drug company, and in effect he's a drug salesman, but remember the doctors don't buy anything. He's detailing the scientific facts of the medicine for the company, right? And he leaves them samples, he leaves them literature, he may leave him two tickets to a Steelers game. You know, he's, he's a goodwill man, you see. He does a lot of things. At Christmas, he leaves him things for his children, okay? The drug detail man in many doctor's offices he is taken in, is given a lot of time because that doctor hasn't got time to read the literature. He doesn't know the literature. He doesn't know the side effects. He doesn't know whether he'll kill you or not. And that's a sad circumstance. Now, you've got a very important instructor here who has to have time with you, so I want to move to the last chief because it's going to, I told you, be the one I'm going to have the least 
to deal with. Whenever we get near more real morality and ethics and issues, I want to uh, bow out but pose some questions for you. We're on the last sheet, and you might read it through for whatever small value that is, and then we'll chat about it a few minutes, and I'll bow out. As you finish reading, you might want to get out, if you have brought them along, the two pages of tables that I gave you last time, and we might talk about positions statistically in connection with some of these issues. Uh, the pages at the bottom should be in sequence 10 and 11 on one, and behind it 12 and 13, when you, it's this group of tables. If any of you don't have them, huh? There's probably some people who didn't get them. All right, I have a few extras here. Somebody, you had, you had those, I get, he, he's got a couple that he God, if some, if some of the people were not here, but some would say, you got need them? Okay, there's more here. Now, this is taken from a very new uh, document called the Salaried Position, which was actually published uh, at the end of last month, and it's, some of the data in it is remarkably up to date, com you know, compared to anything else I've seen. And that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have a viewpoint. I think it does, and one that I'm not always in agreement with is with some of the other things that I've uh, presented to you just to be certain that you're provoked enough to think about these questions. First of all, on table one on page 10, that's very recent data through December 31, 79. And the most important figure is the bottom of the first column, the next to the last number, 248,931. That's people that are not in the military, not in VA hospitals, not in, in <coughs> federal institutions. The number of people who are office-based, it's about a quarter of a million doctors who are office-based, meaning they're not residents, still in training. The next column, they're not hospital-based, you know, they're based in their own offices. They're not other, most of other is academia and research doctors. So the rest of the numbers are not as important, but that one's very important, about a quarter of a million and increasing. Uh, anybody notice anything about female physicians? They distribute in Table 2, divides them for 1978 in response to certain questionnaires, a big sample. Uh, they did a male physician sample, a female physician sample. Any significant differences in any categories? The fastest one your eyes should be able to pick up is in the percent column. On salary, about a quarter, 24, 20, about one quarter of male physicians are on salary and about 40% of females. It's like females going into pediatrics more, into OB more, into psychiatry more than, say, into surgery and surgeries, surgical subspecialties. Okay, on table three, they take only those doctors who are active and receiving a majority of their income from salary in the end of 1979, and again dropping down in the number, the number column, the first numbers. It's the office-based, non-federal. There's 64,000 of them then on salary who are not working for the military or the VA or institutions or agencies. And this is a significant number if you relate it to about a quarter of a million. In other words, we got a very sharply rising number of, of people in a changing status. Whereas the other numbers, I think, uh, once you throw resonance into it, the way they do it, the way they're playing the game here in these tables, 
they're showing 209,000 salaried doctors. Problem for that is that the next biggest number, 61,000, are residents who are obviously salaried while they finish their training. And uh, hospital-based, meaning, and I think the terminology is false because they might be a hospital-based pathologist or radiologist or anesthesiologist and be on a salary plus. They might be guaranteed 120000 and really be a fee doctor in many cases. The answers to these questionnaires I don't trust as much the way it's done here. Otherwise, you'd say you might be getting a revolution in medicine almost today, you know, 209,000 salary doctors. What are we talking about? All this fee for service. It sounds like these are people that accept a salary in huge numbers, you see. When you break it down the way I just have, you, you see more concretely that the cottage industry, part of it is about a quarter of a million people, 248,000, 64,000, about little more than a quarter of them are on salary and even that we're not sure of what it means. Do four ENT men that own their own practice in a certain town, did they answer the questionnaire by saying we take out, you know, we're on salary, meaning to the firm we own? We're not sure. It, it, things are changing. I want to make this point to you and I'm using this data sheet for it, but I'm not sure it's as fast or as speedy or as revolutionary as these figures indicate in the data from this new publication. The second bunch of data I'm going to skip over because I've, with this, made the major point of that, and I want to only suggest to you that this data aside, there are a tremendous number of doctors being put into a salaried position not the way you see it in your community or at the med center in, in other words, it's not like, say, at Fairmont Clinic or at uh, the med center in Morgantown. They are rather in the larger places where the dollars are, and Fairmont's not a place where big dollars are, okay? But in the Sun Belt, in California, in a lot of places, big corporations are moving in and hiring doctors and offering all kind of shopping center services, nine to nine, seven days a week. The, let's take the ER service, the emergency room service at Fairmont General Hospital. Are doctors employed by whom? A what? A California corporation. They're on the payroll of a California corporation. Now, don't forget that. It has touched you already in Fairmont. Now, imagine these corporate entities that are just like General Motors and moving in. They're moving in on this cottage industry. And ask yourselves now which way you want to go, okay? You still that scared of socialism? You still that scared of change or a social system? Because how much personal care are you going to get and who are you going to file a grievance with? when it's all based in a Chicago office, a New York office, a San Francisco office, and they've got a great many of this. There are more, in my experience, in the places I go into, just by invitation or something, there are more motion in this area than I've ever seen in the last two years, in, in my whole lifetime observing it. There are more corporations buying medical groups out, uh, offering to buy them out, uh, buying up HMOs, buying up anything they can lay their hands on. It's as if big business suddenly discovered, like a certain businessman did about seven miles from here, that there's a lot more money to be made in medicine than in furniture, okay? They've made up their mind there's a lot more money to be made in, in medicine than you can ever make on the stock market. There are real dollars here. The cash flow is unbelievable. The policing is from nowhere. The insurance companies are scared of you. The uh, government is scared of you. And you can bill the living hell out of anything and get the dollars you need and order anything you want to. And it's an unbelievable decision to invest their capital and their enterprise in seizing control of this laughable cottage industry, if you please, you know, on a modern scene. 
And the real question for Americans is how are you now going to cope? How are nurses going to cope who could bargain with nonprofit hospitals if that nonprofit hospital sells out to Hospital Corporation of America? They send in a skilled union buster that decides you're, you're making more money than nurses in Pittsburgh. We're going to end that. We're going to end it in a hurry, okay? How's anybody going to cope? The workers in the industry or anything else? It's as drastic as the changes in the coal industry. Who today is the biggest single owner of the coal industry over the last 15 to 18 years have bought into it in huge amounts so that what used to be local consolidation coal and all of that, who now are the owners? Oil companies. Houston is the capital of the United States. Did you all still think it was in Washington? You, you're unbelievable, really. You don't know where people go to get their money? You don't know where all the unemployed left Detroit to go and they're, they're living under bridges and, it's, and all that. Don't you read the newspapers? There's 30,000 people living under bridges in Houston, unemployed and all. Texas doesn't know anything about unemployment compensation, about welfare, about food stamps. They don't believe in it. It's un-American. And all the unemployed pour down to the Sun Belt looking for this stuff. But the money is there. The Arab sheiks, they don't fly. They fly straight from Houston from Araby now. That, that's the new flights. Houston is the capital. And, uh, and, and in health care, it's Nashville. You thought it was still music, didn't you? <laughs> uh, Grand Old Opry used to be downtown. Now it's a piece of Disneyland out there called Opryland and, you know, just a showpiece. And uh, the real cute little old uh, gospel church where they all began is, uh, is something to go visit if you visit Nashville. And those are the changes. I simply suggest to you, Think about it. There are huge corporate changes that are occurring in your lifetime very quickly. In the 1880s, they may see most doctors salaried before, eight, before 1990. And what are the consequences? Will doctors form unions? Undoubtedly, yes. Quicker than you nice little nurses will. <laughs> Quicker, because the AMA is the best union. It trained them. And is that in our best interest? Maybe. If they're like the residents and the interns, then they condemn the establishment and they condemn the hospital and they say it doesn't give enough care and we want more equipment. They're idealistic like nurses are, okay? That's really what's happened. The first residents and interns unions are tremendously idealistic. They're good for the public. They demand more doctors per patient, you know, and per floor. They demand this and that before they ask for more wages. But how about if all this bunch decides to, if they go salaried and they form a union, I'm not sure the public interest will be on their mind. It'll be what we want from you, Mr. Conglomerate, is a guarantee of $160,000 a year plus a per, uh, part of the a percentage of the proceeds, you know. It's liable to be demands of, an, of a character that'll break the bank in our country. I hope I've provoked you. I haven't intended to be uh, a nice guy and make it all easy for you, but I've tried to stimulate your thinking, and I thank you very much for your attention and your kindness in these two sessions.